giving all grace, praise, honor, and glory to God. Thank you this morning for joining us for fellowship and worship. My name is Reverend Joseph Polonius Wright Sr. I'm Associate Minister at Second Calvary Baptist Church where our senior pastor is Reverend Dr. Jeffrey V. Guns. I count it an honor and privilege to be asked by my cousin and your, our past, your pastor, Pastor Freeman, to preach on his seventh anniversary celebration, amen? amen? And I have, Tony and I, well, we call him Tony, <laughs> Pastor Freeman and I have uh, served time in other places other than ministry. We served time in the Marine Corps together at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He was, I was a ground pounder. He was over at French Creek, uh, blazing in the shade. We were together when he and First Lady Selena had their, their first child, Marquis. Yeah. We all lived together with my first wife in uh, North Carolina. And we were honored to be called their, her grandparents. And I thank God for her and for the time we had, that we shared together. Pastor Freeman has grown a lot. <laughs> a lot just as I have and just as all of us have by the grace and mercy of God, amen? And to have seven years as a pastor of the church that you grew up in, your home church, is not only an honor, but it is also a special calling by God. And we count it not robbery to celebrate this seventh year and also the calling by God for his leadership of this congregation. So without further ado, I came to deliver a word from God, and that is what I shall do. Amen. Let us pray. Father, as we humbly come before you this day, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. We thank you for this branch of Zion, Mount Zion Baptist Church. We thank you for your called leader, Pastor William A. Freeman Sr. We thank you, Father, for another freeman being licensed today and his son called into the gospel we thank you for the sunshine you brought us and we thank you lord god for the shade we thank you for the breeze lord god and we thank you more than anything for your son i ask now lord god that you anoint my tongue untangle my thoughts and make them clear let what you have given me now be shared with those that you have brought about in fellowship and in worship to you let the word of truth go forth, for your word never returns void. Let every heart, mind, body, and spirit be touched, moved, and Father, led in your way. I ask these and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Pastor Freeman gave me the call, the first thing I did is get on my knees and pray. I asked the Lord to give me what he had for us, not just you, but for us, each and every one of us. Because any time that a preacher is called to preach, then that word should be from God and not from him or her, he or she, they or them. Every word that is preached from this Bible should be first placed in the heart of the minister and the messenger by the Holy Spirit. That is what I've been called to do today, to bring forth the truth on this pastoral anniversary. The scripture reading will come from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 12 through 17 from the New International Version. The Word of God reads as such. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Thus ends the reading of God's word. As I stated, God has given me the word to give and he's given me the title as I say to you now. The call and duty for the pastor. The call and duty for the pastor. As I read the scripture, you see that Jesus not only appeared to the disciples after his resurrection, but he appeared three times. The first two times can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. When he appeared to the disciples at those times, the first time he appeared in the room, the doors were locked, but Jesus gained entry. He is the resurrected Savior. He went to the disciples after his resurrection a week later into this room where they had gathered. They had gathered the do and the door was locked because of their fear of the Jews. They feared the Jews would hunt them down, kill them for being a follower of Jesus. But Jesus entered to bring them a message. He entered into that room with one disciple being absent, and that disciple was Thomas, also called Didymus, the twin. When he appeared, the first thing he said was, Peace be with you. He showed them his nail-scarred hands and his nail-scarred feet. And at that time, they worshiped and praised him and called him Lord. Now Peter, I'm sorry, when Thomas was absent, when he did return, the disciples told, of him, told to him their encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, their resurrected Savior, their Lord, their Master. But Thomas didn't believe it. Thomas said that he would have to put his fingers into the side and the hands of Jesus to believe that he is, had been raised from the dead. That was the second encounter. That second encounter, Jesus appeared again with Thomas present at this time. And he did just as Thomas had requested he do. He showed him his nail-scarred hands and allowed Thomas to put his hands his fingers into those scars. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, Thomas was a doubter. As many of us were doubters before Jesus encountered us in our life. When Jesus came into that locked room of our life, now I know you're wondering, well he said the scripture was coming from chapter 21, but I had to feed you before I could lead you, amen. I had to bring you into the place of the third appearance so you wouldn't be Googling the first two, because I need your attention here and now. As I stated, the title of the message is the call and duty for the pastor. And the verses that I'll be focusing on are 15 through 17 from chapter 21. Now these verses have been preached many a day about the restoration and the, reinstate, the reinstating of Peter to Jesus because you know that Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus was brought to the Sanhedrin in that mock trial of his. He denied him three times and you will hear it preached that Jesus reinstated Peter to his place of fellowship and his place and position as a disciple of his. But if you dig further, you will see even more than that. And that is what we're going to do today. We're going to pull out the bulldozers from heaven and dig a little bit for God's gold. Amen. When we look at verse 15, we see that it states, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
In his first appearance, Jesus called Peter out. He had called Peter aside. He had separated Peter and not asked Peter these questions before the other disciples. That's where you find your pastoral calling in this message. You see, as I read to you the first two appearances of Jesus to his disciples, they were in a group. They were in a group at the beginning of this, as I read in verses 12. But he called Peter aside because he had a little more for Peter that's just the real statement. He had a calling to Peter that he was going to bring about. And he wanted Peter's full attention. He wanted Peter's attention because he had to get Peter in the place that he needed him to be for this called work of ministry that he was calling him to. And we're talking about Jesus personally calling Peter to this calling. So when he asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He wanted Peter to be reinstated and called back to that boldness that Peter had when he followed Jesus. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. If you remember Peter, Peter was always the outspoken disciple. Peter was always the one that said that, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'll be right there by your side regardless of what you go through. When they came to capture Jesus in the garden, Peter was the one that pulled out the sword and chopped, out, chopped off the ear of one of the army personnel that had come and accompanied those who came to arrest Jesus. See, Peter was always bold about his business, but when they arrested Jesus and Peter was around that fire, Peter got to cussing and denounced Jesus. Now, Jesus wanted to make sure that he knew Peter's heart. He wanted to make sure that Peter knew that this was a one-on-one. -on -one. He fed all of them together with the fish and the bread, Pastor Friedman. Yes, he fed them first so their physical body would be nourished. But then he wanted yes, a spiritual sir. nourishment for Peter. Do you follow me? Uh, Are you with me so far? When he asked Peter, do you love me more than these? He wasn't asking Peter to be arrogant. He wanted Peter to understand that to be the pastor, to be the leader, you have to love me more than anyone else. You have to have a passion yes, that exceeds and abounds more than anyone can expect, even yourself. Yeah. He wanted to ask Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter searched his heart and he told him, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Yeah. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. You see, when a pastor is called, Christ wants to know, and he wants that pastor to know, that I need you to be on top of your game at all times. I need you to be above and beyond, not only in the pulpit, but also at the food line or the Walmart, because you're representing no longer yourself, but you're representing me. You're representing my ministry. You're representing what the Word of God means and what it stands for. You are standing instead or for me on this earth as my representative and ambassador. I have called you to be a leader and I need to know do you love me more than you love yourself and all others? Do you love me more than anybody else? Because if you don't have the passion, then you can't do the pushing. Amen? If you don't have the passion, you can't do the pushing. I need you to have that passion for me more than your congregation. I need you to have the passion for me more than these people of the world. I need you to have more passion for me than all of Satan's angels have when they go about his business. I need to know, do you love me more than these? So Jesus was putting himself. He wanted Peter to know, I need you to put Jesus, me, as your priority and provide the proper food. You said, now wait a minute, where did he get the proper food? Because he said, not only when he asked him that he love him, Jesus told, when he told Jesus, yes, I love you, he said, feed my lambs. You got to understand something. A lamb is different from a sheep. A lamb is a babe. A lamb is a babe and a lamb is a newcomer uh -huh. to the fold. So when he said feed my lambs, you guys can't as the pastor feed that 
nourishing steak first. You got to feed that Similac. You had to feed that infamil. You got to feed that baby food, that pureed piece of justice. You have to feed the grace and mercy first so that that, new, that newcomer, that lamb, can come to understand what the faith is all about, who Jesus is and why he came. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When you feed that lamb, you have to be ready for that lamb to be nourished. You have to rock that baby. You have to feed them that milk. You have to be to them like the Father that God is to us. Amen? Yeah, amen? See, so when I say that you have to put Jesus as your priority and provide the proper food, that is the job of the pastor. Yeah. That is the job of the leader. That is the one, job of the one that Jesus himself calls to minister his word. Uh -huh. As Philip has been called, as Pastor Friedman has been called, as I've been called, as Pastor Mike Johnson has been called, Reverend Mike Johnson has been called, and so many others, we have to remember that our priority is first Jesus. And that when we feed, we feed as the people need. So Jesus wanted him to feed the lambs. Pastor Freeman, I know, has fed the lambs. Pastor Freeman, I know, has Jesus as his priority because I watch him. I watch him every Sunday just like you come to hear him. See, I don't stand up here and just follow folk because they call me. I'm not looking for a limelight or a spotlight. I'm looking for my glory in heaven. Man has nothing for me that is better than that which God has given me, which is salvation. Amen. So I know that you have been fed as a lamb. And I know that Jesus is the priority of the pastor of this church. But when Jesus gave this proclamation and asked Peter, these things and Peter answered him with the right answers those answers from his heart and Jesus gave him the instruction to feed the lambs Jesus also had something else in store for him this is just the first question amen and this is just the first thing to make Jesus the priority and to feed the proper food now Jesus went again and asked him a second time now how many times did Peter denied Jesus. Honk your horn as many times as Peter denied Jesus. All right, three times. So how many times do you think Jesus is going to ask Peter, does he love him? All right, I got three times again. Y'all on top of your game. I told you, Pastor Friedman, you've been doing your thing right. So this is the second time that he now asks Peter. In verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. See, the first thing Jesus wanted him to do is put him first as his priority and provide the proper food. Now he's telling him to take care of my sheep. He's telling Peter... And this to protect and plot the course for the flock. Amen. Amen. See, it's not just the duty of the pastor to give the word. It's not just the duty of the pastor to feed the church, to feed the flock, to feed the lambs. But it's also the duty of the pastor to protect and plot the course for the flock. Amen. Now, if you look at this day and age, you find a lot of pastors that have gone about their own agenda. The gospel isn't good enough. It's the eisegesis that's being stated instead of the exegesis of the scripture. It's supposed to be biblical scripture. That's the only BS you should be receiving, not the BS that's not fit for human consumption. Amen? So when, you, when, the, when the pastor gets in the pulpit, he's called to protect and plot the course of the flock as well. You say, well, where do you see that? You see that where it says, take care of my sheep. In some versions of the Bible, you'll find it where it says, to shepherd my sheep. And if you check Strong's Concordance, you'll find that the word for shepherd is poi mai no, poi amino, poi mai no. And then when you look at the definition, the biblical definition, it says that shepherding, pastoring, pastoring is distinct from feeding. 
It focuses on tending, which includes guarding, guiding, and folding the flock, and is only provided by Jesus Christ, the shepherd, who calls under shepherds, such as elders, overseers, and pastors, to guard and guide his people. So I told you I came here to give you the biblical scripture. So when he calls the pastor, you say, well, why does he need to protect and how can he protect? He protects the flock by giving them his nourishing word from the Bible. He protects them from the enemy's attacks because you know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you today. Once you give your life to Christ, you can expect your next attack to be from the enemy. You can attack the next one to come to you, not to be the Lord, but the enemy trying to disrupt what the Lord has brought about. So the pastor needs to protect and plot the course for his flock, just as Jesus did. When we look back in the Bible, we see that Jesus never left his disciples unequipped. He always prepared them for what was to come. He always told them who was their enemy. He taught them to look beyond the flesh and see behind the curtain and see the hand of Satan, the great puppeteer, who tries to orchestrate that destructive power of his into the life of every Christian that comes about. Amen? Amen. So the pastor has a job that is called to protect and plot the course for the flock. And in doing that, he has to not only feed them, but he has to take the lead. If you, I'm going to use an infantry term here, you have to become the point person. You have to be the one to walk out in front. That's what the pastor leads from the front, not from the rear. Yeah. The pastor is the general from the front. He goes or she goes before the flock to make sure that there aren't any booby traps, snares, or thickets that will come about. But we know that there will be trials and tribulations, amen? And that pastor's job is to prepare for those trials and tribulations. We've all read about the things that have been happening in our society. Children being killed, shot in school, elementary school. Grocery stores being shot up because people don't like people because of the color of their skin. People out here harming people for no rhyme or reason. Preachers compromising the word, the, the word of God to satisfy the souls of people instead of trying to save the souls of those same people, amen? So we have to prepare the flock by letting them understand clearly what God considers in his word and what he will have us to do as Christians. Because we are to look like the world. We are not citizens of this world. We are only passer throughers. We are only travelers. We are only visitors. We are citizens of the kingdom once we give our lives to Christ. And as citizens of the kingdom, we are also change makers. But you can't be a change maker if somebody's making change with you. The only one that we need to make change with us is God himself, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the true word of God. The pastor has to protect the flock because he knows the flock will come under attack. Amen? Can I get a hump from a horn out there somewhere? Can you hear what I'm saying to you? Can you hear this truth from God? Now, when the pastor is protecting the flock and plotting this course, he's making sure that he's guided in God's word. He's making sure that God is the true leader. He's making sure that everything he feeds you as he leads you is that from the God above. Amen? Just as Jesus led the disciples, the pastor's job is to do the same, to make sure that they are prepared when they go out into the world to make disciples of all nations. To make sure that when their trials and tribulations, their stresses and their illnesses, their sicknesses and their health, when their marriages are challenged, when things look like they're, they're dismal, worse, when you hit the bottom of the barrel, the pastor is equipping you so that you are ready to bounce back from that thing by bouncing on the trampoline of God's founded word. Amen. That's a word that never changes. That strategy that the pastor puts in place as he plots that uh, path for your journey, and that his journey as well, or her journey, is one that is not only founded by the Word of God, but it is also supported by the Holy Spirit. 
See, the pastor can only give you the word. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit and your willingness to receive that power for you to be able to be transformed and not just informed. Amen? Because anybody can give you information, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit for you to be transformed. Just like the Transformers in the cartoons. Once you give that power to the Holy Spirit, you can transform and you can mold out. Just like Optimus Prime said. But the Optimus one in our lives is the Holy Spirit. He does not leave us nor forsake us. He goes where we go. Even when we fall into sin, he still stays with us. Don't let anybody try to fool you and tell you that the Holy Spirit leaves you just because you've fallen a little bit. No, he stands and stays with you just as Jesus said he would. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. Now, it may sound like I'm traveling down a road and babbling, but I want you to understand that that, that strategy, that planning and that plotting, that protection is not only given by God, ordained by God, and used through the pastor, but it is the only way that you can make it through these challenges that come about in your life. With suicide being on the rise as it is, that, that depicts how heavily our society has given up hope. But we, we all know as Christians that our hope is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just as God raised him from the dead, he has raised us from the dead and the debt of sin. So when our pastor protects us and plots that strategy, we need to remember that he or she is not only the one that does that, but we have to do it ourselves. We have to get into the Bible ourselves. We have to earnestly study. And we have to put our trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We have 66 proven books, tried, tested, and true, that have never failed anyone that has laid their lives in the hands of these words. Amen? Amen. So it's not only the calling to the pastor and his duty or her duty, but it is also the calling to us as Christians. We have to be accepting of this word. We have to remain and keep our hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not in man. For the word teaches us not to trust in man, nor in princes or in rulers. That covers government and all mankind. Put your trust in the Lord, in the Lord. That's where you can find sure dependence. That's where you can find sure deliverance, amen? Now we saw that Jesus has put himself as priority and provide and told Peter to provide the proper food. We know that he has called the pastor to protect and plot the course of the flock. But he asked Peter one more time in verse 17. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it says that Peter got caught up in his feelings. Peter said, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Now listen to his response. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, when Jesus asked Peter this third time, Peter got caught up in his feelings, like I said. And Peter was hurt. But I want you to notice something right there. Peter didn't just tell Jesus, you know that I love you. This time, the first thing he said was, you know all things. I told you we were going to dig deep, amen? When he said, you know all things, this is different from the prior two times that, G that Peter replied to Jesus because this time Peter is actually broken. You see, you can't have that real connection with Christ until you've been broken. Until you have been brought to that place where you have to look and reflect inside of yourself and see that yes, yes, I know that I love you, but this I know even more, that I know you know all things. When Peter made that proclamation, Peter was now proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. 
the true son of God. You see where I get that from? Right here from this biblical scripture. When he said, you know all things, like I said in the previous two answers, he did not make that proclamation. Here he says first, you know all things. Who knows all things but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, amen? So now he is back into right fellowship. Now he's back on that vertical and not just the horizontal. Because you know the cross starts going up before it can go out. You can't hang a, hang a beam on a horizontal without first hand the vertical. God had, Christ had to get Peter straight on the vertical. And when he broke him this time with that third question, when he broke him this time with the same question for a third time, it broke Peter emotionally and brought him into that place where now I know you love me and now I know you know who I am, amen? Because he is the great I am. But he had to get Peter to that place, that same place that he has to get every pastor so that every pastor knows that Jesus knows it all. He knows the truth of our hearts. He knows the truth of our every statement. He knows where we are and when we are, even when we don't know where we are. He knows when we're lost. He knows when we are found in him and him only. Amen. He broke Peter down. He broke Peter so that Peter could be a right vessel to be used as a pastor of the church. And this pastoral calling, as I said, we're here to celebrate Pastor Friedman's seventh anniversary as pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church. But this is how it begins. It begins with that calling. It begins because as the pastor, once you're broken, then you and the church can progress together. But the pastor has to change the diet. Let me tell you why I say we got to change the diet. It's in the scriptures it's right here. We change the diet because in 17, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, in verse 15, he said, feed who? Okay, y'all in the car, so I'm going to say it for you. He said, feed my lamb. Feed my lamb. But now he's saying, feed my sheep. He's telling the pastor now to feed my sheep. He also, like I said, he broke him. You see, the pastor progress, when I say you progress together and you have to change the diet, the pastor grows with the church and not stay behind the church, amen? The pastor is called to grow in the gospel just as he or she is called to bring the lamb into the righteous place of being a sheep. See, if you're sitting back and you're still feeding on milk and palpum, and you're feeding on Similac and Infamil, you're still a lamb. Now, either the pastor isn't doing their job, or you're not doing yours. But God does not call us to stay in the same place. He calls us to be progressive in the work, as we like to say, we are progress in work. But I haven't met a bill, anyone yet that had a house that they allowed the contractor to continue to build without that work being progressive. And that is what ministry is all about. That is what pastoring is about. Ministering to the point where you grow. Not where you remain slow, but you grow. And you grow together. You grow together because it is the job of the pastor, as I stated earlier, to have more passion for Christ than anyone else. And as he feeds the lamb, they should be progressing to the sheep. Now you have to change that diet because I can't keep feeding you the milk. It's now time for you to chew on the meat and bones of the gospel, Pastor Freedom. It's now time for you to learn about not only grace, but forgiveness. It's now time for you to learn how to love unconditionally. It's now time for you to understand that you are no longer the keeper of yourself. That you now belong to Jesus Christ. You have now surrendered all. So the pastor has to change the message and start going into the deeper verses in this Bible. And that is what the pastor is called to do. The pastor is called to progress along with us, but also to make sure that you're growing in the, not only the faith, but in the word. So that when you go out there equipped in this world, that when life and circumstances get to beating you down, you're able to withstand the blow. Amen? That you're able to look beyond that person that you just can't stand anymore and say, I love you. That you're able to pray for that person that's maybe called your enemy, but no one is an enemy of God that accepts his son, Jesus Christ. You may be able 
to now forgive and forget. Not just forgive, but you have to forget. Because not only does God forgive us of our sins, but he says he cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, down to the depths of the sea. So if he can do it, then we can do it. Amen. That's why you are no longer sheep. I mean, no longer lamb, but now sheep. So if you're still walking around out here waiting for some milk from Pastor Freeman, then you might need to get on another train. Because this train right here is riding on the tracks of righteousness. This train right here at Mount Zion is riding on the word of God. The only BS you're going to receive is biblical scripture. Not that other non-human consumed BS. Amen. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'll let you figure it out. It might win a little over your head, but I'm sure you'll catch it later on. Amen. So when... Jesus is speaking to Peter in these three verses, 15, 16, and 17. You can no longer look at it as, G as Jesus just reinstating Peter. You now have to look at it from another point of view. You have to look at it from a pastoral calling for duty. You have to look at it as the instructions, simple instructions, three things that Jesus told Peter to do as the oncoming pastor of the church. He told him three little things. One, Feed my lambs. Two, take care of my sheep. Three, to feed my sheep. Now notice he didn't say that Peter's sheep. He said whose sheep? If it's Jesus' sheep, honk your horn. If it's Jesus' flock, honk your horn. If it's Jesus' lamb, honk your horn. Mount Zion belongs to Jesus, and the under-shepherd is Pastor William A. Freeman Sr. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. You may have hired him, but God called him. Amen. And God has sustained this church and pastor for seven years. We know that that number seven is a number of significance in the Bible. Amen. But we know that he could not have done it, Pastor Freeman, of and in and of himself. He had to follow the way and word of God first. And all he asked you to do as a congregation is to do the same. Not follow him, but follow Jesus as Jesus goes. Because sometimes anybody and everybody may trip. Anybody and everybody can slip. Anybody can slip, trip, and fall. But there's one who has never fallen at any time, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you follow Jesus and the true word of God, not only will you grow and progress from a lamb, but you not only be a sheep, but you may be called like this young preacher right here has been called and licensed to do amen follow the lord and not mankind it doesn't matter who stands before you in the pulpit it matter who you'll stand before on judgment day amen that's who you need to be concerned with that's who you need to worship each and every day yes it's an honor and privilege and you should honor and come and celebrate your pastor but don't you ever Never ever long as you live worship anybody but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The title of this sermon, as I said, is The Call to the Pastor and His Duty. Amen. If Pastor Freeman would join me up here right now. I have a few questions for Pastor Freeman. <laughs> Now, Pastor Freeman, you heard the word? Yes, sir. Did it come straight from the scripture? Straight from the scripture. Now, I have three questions for you, Pastor Freeman. Yes, Are you ready for the question? Yes, sir. The question, the first question. Do you mm -hmm. love Jesus more than these? Yes, I love Jesus more than any. Feed his lambs. Right. Pastor Freeman? Yes, sir. Do you mm -hmm. love Jesus? Yes. Take care of his flock. Amen. Amen. Pastor Free. Yes, sir. Do you mm -hmm. love Jesus? Yes, love Jesus. Feed his sheep. You heard it here. You heard the word. You were given the question. You heard the answer. Let the proclaimed gospel of Jesus Christ lead God and direct you in everything that you do. And it's also part of the flock's uh, job and duty to support their pastor as well, amen? amen? When he's right and when he's wrong, when he's wrong, you're to call him out just as Peter was called out by 
Paul himself. But you do just like Jesus did. You pull him to the side or you pull her to the side. Amen. Now, this is not a reinstatement of the pastor. This is just a proclamation on his seventh anniversary. Because he may not have proclaimed before everybody on Facebook or wherever his love for Jesus Christ and his passion for the church and the ministry. But you heard it here, if not the first time, another time. Amen. That's all I got for you today. Okay. Okay. Now there may be someone here today or someone on Facebook who has not given their life to Christ that are still trying to escape their sins in and of their own power and of their own self. But I'm here today to tell you that not only are the doors of the church open, but the doors, the arms of Jesus are open and they are waiting. Repent of your sins. Believe in your heart that God yeah. raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. Believe in your heart that he died on the cross at Calvary yeah. so that we could be redeemed to the Father. Yeah. Believe in your heart that he awaits you right now. Yeah. If you don't have a church home, you can be, uh, become a member of the family of Mount Zion Baptist Church. I believe the address is 1622 Amen. East Liberty Street. Chesapeake, Virginia. You can find Pastor on Facebook. You can look in the church website. But you need to find somewhere where you can have a Bible teaching, Jesus preaching, church, pastor, and family. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these seven years that you have blessed Mount Zion Baptist Church and Pastor William A. Freeman. We thank you for giving us your word, Lord God, and supplying us the things that we need to persevere through these storms, trials, and tribulations. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood at Calvary. We thank you for being patient with us, Lord, when we have been in a hurry to get away from you. We thank you for loving us more than we could ever love you or love ourselves. We thank you for this message today and pray that it will rest, rule, and abide not only in every heart, mind, and spirit, but in the sanctuary and our congregation and pastor and first lady's heart of Mount Zion Baptist Church. May you be blessed, Lord God, and may your name be held on high in our hearts at all times. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen, and they heart, amen. <laughs>